Okay, as the drama mounts. So this was the testimony, and most of it has to do with the Fry hearing. And this is a walkthrough, pretty much in the order in which things happened on that, um, not that cold February day, about a year and a half ago. First thing was the concept that interpretation is based on the same principle, no matter whose match statistic it is. There's DNA data, people infer genotype, and then do a match to a suspect and produce a likelihood ratio. The, there's data, uh, and there's a model of what you think the genotype and the pattern would be. A comparison's made. You produce probabilities, and that's how it's done. And we were able to show that all three methods, inclu inclusion, subtraction, addition, work the same way. Uh, this was one of the slides that was shown to the jury. This is one of these things where I was reminded of Alice's Restaurant, remember the song, where he shows up with 57 color glossy photographs with circles and arrows in the back of each one. All I've got to is a long story about it. And uh, Tony chose four. It's a lot of work, but you know, it shows a good four. This is one of the four. And here's the data that were used, the victim profile, the original quantitative data. Which of these methods use the, use the data? Inclusion method does not use the victim profile. It ignores the fact that the victim's in his own DNA, and it uses thresholds. It gets rid of the original data. So it's the least perspicuous of the methods. The subtraction method of uh, Robin Cotton does use the victim profile. And as you saw, when you have those four allele cases that you can pick out by eye, she has a rigorous method that can uh, determine that as well. So it's more informative, but she doesn't use the quantitative data whereas the addition method used by the Trulio computer used the victim profile and the original data. We handed a CD to the court that contained about 50 PDFs of all these articles. And the point of this was to establish, not through our say-so, uh, but from the community, in the relevant community, which I'll get to in a second, that there are many articles going back even 100 years that this has all been, this is old news. There was nothing terribly new in principle about what the Trulial system was doing. Quantitative STR peaks, uh, so this is section A in the handout. But I'm not going to read through all these articles. You can do that at your leisure. That's why it's a handout, right? Uh, quantitative STR peak information has been used since the advent of PCR. Genotype probability distributions date back to Gregor Mendel with the P experiments in the 19th century. If you think about it, what's the probability that the P is it's a quarter or a half, it's the punnets, all that sort of old stuff. Uh, computers have been interpreting STR data since they came out in the 1980s. Statistical modeling and computation uh, has been developing and evolving, but by 1990 had really reached its current state. There's a whole literature on likelihood ratios, the most informative going back to about 1950 with some books written about it and its use in World War II. There are many articles on mixture interpretation and the admissibility. There was an interesting uh, holding from a court uh, in the District of Columbia that had said the Roberts decision from three years ago that had said that DNA uh, interpretation is always admissible, though subject to cross-examination and uh, presenting your own witnesses. Uh, I'll show in a second there are many computer systems for this. And of course, we had our own publications, so that was less germane for general acceptance. I don't think anybody actually, I think in the trial transcript, I actually read this the other day, uh, Prosecutor Krastik said, we're not going to play the CD for you, so, which we didn't. In terms of validations and methodology, we had uh, written an article a few years before that showed how it was even possible to compare methods, and that was published four years ago and how the match score could be used as a measure of information. People do that standardly now, measuring how effective it is, how high the score is, and how reproducible it is. We'll get back to that in a minute. And even then, and uh, Dr. Cotton had collaborated on that paper, we had shown that there was a clear difference between addition, subtraction, and inclusion in the same order that we found in this case. This was a very striking slide. It was published in the paper last year. And this is worth spending a minute on because of what I'm going to show you next on the next slide. Uh, a main question that had come up over and over again that the defense counsel kept hammering was, 
if the FBI got 13,000, don't you expect 13,000? Isn't that what you expect? So this concept of what we expect to see kept being raised over and over again. Well, here's an actual study that was done using Truallel and since published. What you're seeing are 40 different experiments that are mixture experiments. What, this was created uh, by a group in the federal government where they knew what the answer was. They created different mixtures of known proportions, 90-10, 70-30, 50-50, and so on. And then in different amounts of dilution, uh, make less and less DNA, making the, the problem harder and harder. And so these are the 40 answers that the system got on a scatter plot. What you're seeing here is how much DNA was present from the unknown portion. Two-person mixture, victim known, one part's unknown. And this is, again, on an order of magnitude log scale, 10, 100,000. And this is the amount of information, million, billion, trillion, so on. Again, on a log scale, order of magnitude. When you plot this, what you see is that when, when the amount of unknown DNA is over 100 picograms, then it's getting full information. But as the amount of DNA decreases down to 10 picograms, the information, the height that you're getting, is getting less and less and less. And you cross a million to one, which is often considered to be a jury convincing threshold by legal scholars, at about 15 picograms. Does that make sense? So we can look at this and say, this is how much information we actually get in two-person mixtures, just like in the Foley case, based on the amount of DNA is pre present. But we know how much DNA is present. Remember before, there were 1,000 picograms, right? It was a 6.7% mixture. 6.7 times 1,000 is 67 picograms. So we could use this as a calibration curve and look up there are 67 picograms. What do we really expect? Not from what defense counsel is saying, but from scientific studies. If there were 15 loci, we would have expected uh, a quadrillion, 10 to the 15th, coincidentally. We use 12 loci. So this is all scales in a way that you can add things together. And so we would have expected a score of about a trillion to one. The score was about 200 billion to one. So what we got was what we expected based on science. And I think this had an impact on the judge because we bothered to do a study. It's also worth noting we compared many methods in this paper. I think we showed this as well. This is what inclusion does in red. And what you see is when you get uh, much below 100 to 200 picograms of DNA, the method falls apart. And interestingly, the FBI guidelines say that when you get much below 100 picograms, people should not be looking at the data. There's too much uncertainty. So we all agree on that. But the computer has a sensitivity, not a 150 picograms, but more like 15 picograms, and it keeps going. I think there's general agreement that computers can do that as well at this point. This was an interesting concept of what is a threshold. So imagine you have a picture. This is a looks like a man, right? It's not that old. And uh, you can see some features. You don't know what he's thinking, what he's feeling, what's going on, or maybe who he is. But this is all or none. Either it's black or it's white. It's like turning up the contrast on your TV. And now, this is Jimmy Stewart in a, It's a Wonderful Life, which was quite relevant to this case because the Jimmy Stewart Museum is next to the courthouse. In, um, where the trial was held. And so this shows how thresholds tend to lose information. There was an article that was quite important. It's been very important in DNA. It came out in 2006. It's cited in the bibliography as about 10 authors. It's from the DNA Commission on the International Society of Forensic Genetics. And they were asking the question, well, inclusion versus all the other more informative likelihood methods, when would you even want to use inclusion? When would you not consider the victim? When would you not consider quantitative information? And these are all very prominent people, which is why they're on the paper. And Bruce Weir had said, inclusion often robs the items of any probative value. Uh, Bruce had testified in the OJ trial, was very well known. Uh, Charles Brenner, who's 
I think the one and only mathematical statistician in the U.S. out of uh, Berkeley who does forensic DNA, uh, used the stronger word for then, now everybody uses it, but in 2006 to say inclusion discards a lot of information really was considered controversial. It isn't now. And then Michael Krausick in Germany was very diplomatic. He said, inclusion, throwing out the, the victim and the peak height information, does not use as much of the information that's in the data as the likelihood ratio, other approach. But conceptually, they're equivalent. That's the more diplomatic language that people use now. Conceptually, they're all the same, but somehow the information is discarded. And the recommendation was that unlike the inclusion statistic of 13,000, the likelihood ratio is preferred, and half the people on this paper are from the US. So even though uh, the Defense Council did suggest this was uh, put up by some European conclave, that was the quote, in order to you know, inflict mathematics on American courts, I'm not sure what his point was, uh, it really was an international group that involved a lot of uh, Americans. Now, the relevant scientific community came up. What Prosecutor Krastik had defined was the relevant scientific community was not that of the practitioners who applied the methods, but that of the, of the statisticians and forensic scientists, computer scientists, mathematicians, who develop, test, assess, publish, discuss, give talks on, and so on about the methods. I'm part of that community, as are uh, many of the people on the papers, in fact, all the people on the papers, who develop these methods. So by defining the relevant scientific community as those scientists who develop methods, as opposed to those who merely apply them, uh, it, it gave more credence to what the relevant community would be in this case. Christine Tomsey, who uh, was the, the former uh, lab director out in Greensburg and has been faculty at, in the forensics program here at Duquesne, wrote a paper 10 years ago, uh, bef before I even met her, uh, saying mixtures with a known contributor. What do you do with them? What are the policy recommendations? Well, you can infer the genetic profile, that does, and it doesn't have to be one allele pair. It can be a list or probability distribution. It's okay to take the known donor, the victim, and subtract, and you can also use peak height ratios. Well, this is what Robin Cotton did, and that's exactly what the true allele system did. And uh, Christine was known, uh, I think, in that court, as someone uh, from the crime lab, the state lab. This is a major slide and a major study with implications that have led to a complete change in national standards in the last year, something for better, some for worse. This is a study done by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, the old Bureau of Standards. It was done in uh, 2005. And again, this is everything we showed. I mean, it was, the timing of the trial was fantastic because all these articles had been coming out in the literature. Had we done it three years before, there would have been nothing. And all these studies were being done. There are about over 50 laboratories that responded. And what NIST had done is that they sent out the same sample, amplified on different panels, and let any crime lab in the country analyze it. Same data, what results do you get? What match statistic do you get? Well, since match statistic is the same as information, how informative is your DNA review protocol on the identical data that all your peers are looking at? And what they found was that, remember, this is his, this is not mine. He's saying, remember, it's all the same data, guys. Two contributors, known victim, just like in the Foley case. The inclusion methods, which were the majority of results, were just like we saw, four zeros. About 31,000 was the lowest score. The few groups using by eye, as much as the quantitative data as they possibly could, were getting scores up at 200 trillion or 14 zeros. 14 minus 4 is 10. 10 order of magnitude difference, right? A 10 billion fold difference on the identical data, depending on which lab you sent it to. Uh, this paper was never published, largely for political reasons, I think. Um, but new studies were initiated, standards have been created, and the results as a new set of standards which are getting uh, more careful about what people are allowed to do, but actually opened up the way for computers to infer probabilities with genotypes in a way that's now approved by the FBI standards as of last May. So this had dramatic impact 
even though it was never a paper, it was a poster and a slide that dozens of people have been showing for a few years. This is a way of describing statistics with pictures. The point was James Curran had fortunately just published a paper that appeared a few months before the Fry hearing in which he used the same type of statistical modeling, whatever that means. There's a genotype, there's a mixing weight, there's a gene W, right? Let's stop there. And he used the same computing technique, statistical sampling, called MCMC, which I won't go into. So he had done the same statistics, the same computers for resolving two-person mixtures. And he published it. He's in New Zealand. We're out here in southwestern Pennsylvania. So completely different group doing the same work. There were people who used our technology. These were, this was a list that we showed. There were other people who had mixture systems, perhaps not as sophisticated as ours, but based on similar principles. And we were able to list six of them, including our own, from all around the world of commercial systems, academic systems. This is not a new idea. People were talking about it for 10 years, and people were in different, and scientists were in different stages of implementation. And these were the other four slides that Prosecutor Krastik let me show. So I, I, don't know, I don't even know how you chose them. I thought it was kind of random, but they were very good. So here are the 13 CODIS loci, and this is how much likelihood ratio. Again, this is no longer the number of zeros. This is the actual number, 1, 10, 20, 30, and so on, at each of the 13 loci of what the inclusion method produced. And when you multiply those numbers together, you get 13,000. What did Robin Cotton do? She did about the same on all those two and three allele loci. But on the four allele loci, where you can pull out the two huge alleles of the victim and the two small alleles of someone else and nail it as a unique identification, she was able to get a huge amount of information up over you know, 50, 30, and so on. And when you multiply her numbers together, that addition of just considering the victim as being part of the sample adds three orders of magnitude from four to seven, and she's up to 23 million. And I think this was the point uh, that the prosecutor was trying to make, is that it's not magic. Now we show what the computer does in blue. The computer is doing no more, that, essentially, than what Robin Cotton was doing on the four allele, easy loci, but using quantitative information on two more loci got a little more information maybe a little more over here. And when you multiply all those blue bars together, you get a number that adds another four zeros, another four powers of 10, and brings you up to 189 billion. So I think the point was well taken. This isn't magic. It's just more computing. And it's reinforcing that when people get a little bit more, the computer will get a little bit more. But then it can go a little bit beyond. And this shows that if there were a perfect match, sort of like if somebody cheated and just wrote down the answer and looked at, at the suspect, you would pick up yet another three orders of magnitude and go up to almost a quadrillion. But that didn't happen. So that's how much information could have been left over, but probably was not in the evidence data. Okay. So on the cross-examination, I'm going to uh, sum this up. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. This is just one slide. Uh, we, I was asked, how, re, how can reliable DNA give different statistics? And I think that's what you've been hearing for the last few hours, and that's what we explained. If you look at it differently, you will get a, a different information from the same data. Why doesn't the computer use thresholds? I revisited down memory lane reading through the transcripts last night. Um, well, the answer is because it doesn't need to. It can use statistical modeling to work out what its confidence is. It doesn't need to throw out the data. Has this method ever been used before in court? It's not particularly relevant for a Fry hearing, I think. I don't know. Maybe it is. We'd be having a Fry hearing if it had. Yeah. Um, and so the answer was no, not yet. But that was answered very nicely by Judge Martin uh, a few weeks later, in which he ruled, and you, you have that opinion. 
I, again, there's no quiz on it, but if you want to go through it, it's only six pages long. And he reviews for you, which is convenient for the CLE, all the material we just showed. Uh, that, in fact, that it's admissible. Now, at the actual trial, again, just in one slide, what were the main features? It was essentially a replay of what we had seen in the admissibility hearing. There's only one principle. You infer a genotype and then match it. But the different methods make different use of the data. And if you make better use of the data, you extract more information. Why? Because you, you concentrate more information on what turn, probability what turns out to be the right answer. That mix 5 study was, shows there is a huge variation in interpretation that the whole forensic science community and DNA knows about. Ten orders of magnitude. It's, this isn't anything you need to make up. But the validation study that we did could predict what the match result would be. On the cross-examination, we revisited three themes. Uh, why are there different statistics? And this is becoming a trend in many crime labs where defense counsel will say, oh, uh, there are four different numbers. Why are there? And then somebody will explain, well, because there are four different ethnic groups for, for four different populations. The denominators are different. And then it doesn't make much of a difference, but you know, it's explained. Uh, something that I heard only last week that, that happened in a crime lab is uh, defense counsel made a very big point out of there were three different match numbers completely. Well, there were three different items of evidence. So you can always bring it up, but it's usually not terribly relevant. In fact, if you can explain how you do the interpretation and where the numerator and the denominator come from, you can answer the question. Shouldn't the same data give the same answer? This was a, a very nice analogy uh, that I think people responded favorably to, I don't know, of using a microscope. I told a long story, having a medical degree, about a patient with pneumonia. I just made it up. But uh, the idea is that if you have a microscope slide and you're looking at it and it's stained and you're trying to diagnose a pneumonia, you could look at it with the naked eye and get one sort of result. Yes, there's a slide there. It's got stained. You could look at it with a magnifying glass. It gives a little more information, perhaps. You could put it under a microscope and actually make the diagnosis and treat the patient. That's the appropriate resolution. You could even use an electron microscope, which is total overkill. But it's always the case in life that you have the same data with different amounts of resolution. Some of you may have a 15 megapixel camera. Some of you may still have your old 2 megapixel camera. You're, you're photographing the same thing, but you're getting different resolution from the same data. Uh, don't computers need thresholds? No. That's what people need, and that's what's limiting the use of DNA in property crime and more difficult cases right now. And that was what happened. And uh, there was a nice quote by uh, is Senior Deputy Attorney General Anthony Krastic, um, who said, John Yelenik provided the most eloquent and poignant evidence in this case. He managed to reach out and scratch his assailant, uh, capturing the DNA under his fingernails. Thank you.